Okay, perfect. Yay. <laughs> well, Carmen, would you like to introduce yourself to everyone and kind of uh, maybe tell everyone a little bit of your background um, coming from South Africa and then now being in the U.S. and okay. all of that? So um, I graduated from uh, the University of Pretoria um, with a textile degree in textile design and technology. And at the time that I graduated, um, I worked for probably about two years in the industry there. And uh, with the South African government allowing the Chinese imports to come in, the textile um, uh, industry basically collapsed in South Africa. So majority of us that were designers started to fall in on our second careers, which is graphic design. So for the last 15 odd years, that's what I've been doing. And um, about three years ago, almost to the day, my husband and I made the decision, he's a US citizen, and we made the decision to come over to the States um, for multitude of different reasons. Um, and I sort of found myself in a position of um, being a stay-at-home mom and settling our family in and taking a step back from my career. And I've gotten to a point now this year through multiple things happening in my life where I'm like, I have an opportunity now to really look for something that I really, that I'm passionate about, that I really want to do. And for as long as I can remember and chatting to friends of mine from Varsity and stuff, um, I've always said, you know, I really want to get back into textile design. It's something that I am passionate about. For years, I've been doodling and doing mandalas and drawing and, you know, I am pattern obsessed. Um, mm -hmm. and which, are, just, which are beautiful, by the way, for anyone who's watching, you should go check out her mandalas and everything. They're super intricate and just, she's thank talented. You. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you. So I, yeah, I've, um, I've, I've been doing that and I now find myself in, with this opportunity to actually get started and rekindling my textile design career. So, you know, I've got all the knowledge of how to, how to set up a portfolio, how to do pattern repeats, you know, the rules, half drop, full drop, you know, all that kind of stuff that computers nowadays do them for. I used to do that all by hand. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, in, that's inspiring to me. I think that's really cool. But. Yes. And I can tell you like, yeah, warp, it, warp, you time, know how to also do it on the computer though. <laughs> yes. So yes, okay. I've got all that knowledge, but coming from um, an environment where the industry number one collapsed and number two is almost non-existent, you know, not being exposed because of apartheid and all that kind of stuff to the international market as well. Cause South Africa, you got to remember was like a bubble for a really long time. Hmm. And it's, it's taken decades for us to kind of get out of and into the international market. Hmm. Um, so, you know, me being full knee deep into my graphic design career I didn't explore any textile opportunities because there were none. Um, so now coming here to the States and having this opportunity, um, I got to a point where I was like, okay, I need to start looking at stuff. And I came across your website and your Facebook page. <laughs> and I was like, ooh, <laughs> here's somebody that I really want to chat to. So, you know, my biggest questions are not about how to set up your business or how to design. It's like, how do you break into the market? Like that is, that is like, um, yes. Yes. So. so I think the, I guess the benefit of being in the U S now is that there's a huge appetite for uh, textile yes. design and fashion design. And there really has never been a better time to be a designer. I don't think um, in terms of just people, I think are now really appreciating the creativity and kind of, I don't know. I feel like there are a lot of like niche markets for all yes. different kinds of personalities and, um, Yes. Yeah, so, okay. Okay. So I have a question about when the Chinese markets took over in South Africa, were the textile companies exclusively working with, uh, with the designs that they were providing? Because so, the actual, even the textile mills and, and, you know, they, they weren't huge mills like you guys know here. I mean, there were probably about four or five big mills in South Africa that used to employ textile designers as well as use freelance designers I worked for a company that did bed linen exclusively for all your big um, sort of your home, home interior chains. And at some point in time, um, you know, what we would do is we would design in South Africa and then send our designs to places like Pakistan or China, <clears throat> excuse me, or China. 
And even that started depleting because we had such a high level of copying and, you know, um, just outright um, plagiarism of designs and stuff like that. It, it became, you know, as a freelance designer, I remember working in, a, in, in an environment where uh, bosses would come to me and say, here's a whole bunch of designs that, that uh, one of our clients gave us that they had purchased from freelance designers and we were basically told to copy them. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm not doing that. So the whole infrastructure of textile design and as a designer, it just kind of went away because it was cheaper for the companies that did manage to weather the, the you know, the sort of your bigger companies, um, it was cheaper for them to buy designs from the Chinese market and from everywhere else overseas than what it was to buy from a freelance designer or to even employ a textile designer. Um, then you got like this, this beautiful little revolution. There, there are a couple companies that sustain themselves. Um, uh, the one I think is called uh, the Design Team Fabrics. Um, and also um, there's another one who I actually work for, Carol Nevin Designs. Um, they're sort of like these niche market little textile companies that kind of um, found this little niche and they managed to sort of survive and weather the storm and have become like nice industry companies now. But um, for the most part of it, it's small uh, family owned businesses and that's kind of, you know, there's no opportunity for as a freelance textile designer or even possibly to be employed by a textile designer. If you look at the amounts of people coming out of universities, um, there's not enough jobs for them. So, I mean, I don't even know if the university that I studied at even offers textile design as a career anymore um, mm -hmm. because of, of, of what, what had happened there. Um, yeah, so I would... I would say that there was a similar issue here in the U.S. and in the South, especially. I'm from Spartanburg, South Carolina originally, which textiles was like the industry. Um, really? It's a small town, but it was the industry there and still is. But a lot of the textile manufacturing did go overseas. Um, yeah. But we still have uh, plenty of, I mean, textile design jobs, you know, for designers. Mm. Um, so that was an issue. Like we have a good family friend who lost his job due to a lot of the manufacturing moving, moving overseas. But we also have like big companies like Milliken, um, Mohawk, you know, some that are still manufacturing domestically, um, even some in North Carolina that are maybe moved to more of a print on demand type of. Yeah. Thing. So there are different, I mean, I don't know, everyone has kind of their own thing. But um, yeah, that's interesting and kind of sad. Do you follow uh, Lisa Glanz at all? She's also a South African illustrator. I'm not sure. No, I've got a list of all my <laughs> designers <laughs> that I actually follow that um, just yeah. so I had a list of them so that I could chat to you about them. Um, I don't, but I will definitely get that name for listen yeah. back to you should, look her, you should look her up. She's not a textile designer, but she is an illustrator and has her own business. Um, and she's on this podcast called The Honest Designers, which is really good. So cool. yeah, I'll definitely check that out. That. <laughs> the other thing that I noticed here when I, when I started looking into this, and I'm not even joking with you when I say I started looking into this about three weeks ago, mm -hmm. I had this epiphany. And um, <laughs> the other thing that I have noticed is that there are a lot of sort of like your small indie brands that are, you know, your niche brands that are, like you say, they'll print a certain amount or you can you order to print and stuff like that. And I mean, I don't know how, or are they designing for themselves? Are they employing designers? Are they outsourcing that? How, you know, that's sort of where I'm stuck at. It's, there's like this jump between being able to actually design and produce designs and to who, where, and how do you approach them? And that's kind of where my disconnect is. And I think a lot of it is to do with because I never studied in this country. I don't know the industry in this country. I don't know who the big players are, let alone the small players and how to even go about establishing oneself with these corporations. Yeah. So there's so many different industries. Um, I guess the first question I would ask you is, um, are you looking to get a job with a company? Or are you looking more to be in licensing or are you looking to freelance? Because those are um, three pretty different things or pretty different goals to have. I think if it was a permanent employment, as long as it's from home, <laughs> I 
Okay. So honestly, if I have to answer honestly, I'm not in there to go and make a big fat salary and to make a huge name of myself. I'd like something that is sustainable. You know, if I land up making a decent salary off of it, that's great. Um, my husband does really well. So I, it's not like I'm in a situation where I have to go out and work. This is more about doing things that I'm passionate about and filling in the gaps because my kids are getting older. So, you know, I'd love this to become like a passive income thing. Um, but you know, that I don't get too tied down with doing one thing. So it probably freelancing <laughs> would, would. And did you say that you're in Nashville? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so I'm in Nashville now. Are you, are you also open to like the illustration side of things or like maybe like gift and um, stationary? Stationary, definitely. I've okay. actually been looking at um, this uh, Happy Planner group, like these people. Okay. There's another, there's another one out there as well that I was looking at. Um, illustrative wise, yes. Um, my kitty's game is strong there. So. <laughs> The reason why I ask is because um, there's a really good company called C.R. Gibson in Nashville, um, and they do work with freelancers. So I interviewed there a long time ago. Um, they're a really great company, more stationary and gift. But um, yeah. if you're doing that kind of design, uh, they're a great company. Um, I interviewed with them a long time ago, but I, they didn't hire me. Um, I was better suited for textiles. But um, yeah, so I mean, you should check them out and see if there is some freelance work you could do for them. Um, but otherwise, um, maybe we should just dive into the questions that you yes. have for me. I can put them on the screen, or if you have them in front of you, we can just... You can put them on the screen. I have got them in front of me, but if you want to do that... Okay, sure. Let I'm me fine with that, too. My okay. All right. And did you do the design on top there? <laughs> I would love to take credit for that, but no, it was something that I did find, but I modified. <laughs> okay. It's really cute. I like it. <laughs> I liked it too. I didn't have time at the, at the point in time, but the actual logo, yes, that was me. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Um, okay. So do you need a specific portfolio then for specific parts of the industry? Um, I think because it's so huge, I mean, my understanding of, of the industry here is so limited. And when I first came here and started researching this, it was sort of blew my mind at how, how much is actually here in comparison to where I'm from. Mm -hmm. um, so I did watch your portfolio tutorial that you had on. And it did speak about, you did speak about um, modifying your portfolio for the client that you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I kind of got lucky because when I was applying for jobs, I really didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> I, uh, I was, you know, 25 or 26 years old. Um, I was working as a graphic designer, but I had majored in fine art and was an oil painter before that. So textile oh, wow. design was totally new to me. I didn't know anything about the industry. Um, and like I said, I interviewed at C.R. Gibson and would have loved yes. to work there, but they didn't hire me. Um, because my portfolio probably just wasn't, I mean, I, I basically didn't even really have a portfolio um, at that point in time. But um, I would say, yes, that the more specific you are with your portfolio, that's going to only help you and like give you a lot better chances. I know like as designers and as creatives, we kind of think that if someone interviewing us can see that we have this ability or this talent, then obviously it will apply to a variety yeah. of products. But Really, I mean, if they can actually see it spelled out in front of them and they can see mm. even mock ups of like your designs on their products, like that is going to sell your abilities better than anything yeah. just because they don't have to do that work of like thinking and like trying to envision it. I mean, yes, they can do that. But, you know, if I saw someone did uh, a cute like illustration of a greeting card, but I'm interviewing them for a rug design, that, you know, that could be, it's not that yeah. they can't do it, but it's like, it might be a big learning curve, right? Yeah. So like they're trying to guess maybe what that learning curve would be. Um, and so if you can put your designs on their specific products, then that's just going to like make your interview and your portfolio that much stronger for them. And it doesn't mean that you can't put the same designs on like different products. If it, if it's yeah. personal, you can totally do that. Like even like the little thing, um, 
your header that you have here over the flowers, like that could be, <laughs> that's perfect for textiles, right? Yes, um, yes, but it absolutely. could also, it could also be on a gift bag. You know, th this is like mm -hmm. a pretty versatile pattern that could be on a lot of different products. Um, but yeah, I think that trying to be specific to the industry is only going to help you. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you find yourself actually refining your portfolio specifically for um, the textiles and away from illustrative or have you kind of balanced yourself in between? At this point in time or when I interviewed in past jobs? At this point in time, like if you look at your, your body of work now, is it sort of a nicely well balanced or did you go very specific? Are you still very specific into uh, textile? I mean, your surface design or... I I definitely design with textiles in mind for a lot of my designs, but not for everything because now I'm doing licensing. And so um, I think that a lot of times surface pattern design and illustration are kind of go hand in hand. And a lot of artists do both mm -hmm. when they're doing licensing. Um, however, when I was applying for textile jobs in the past, like I didn't really show any illustration work. I only yeah. showed things that were relevant to textiles. But um, my ignorance, but can you define licensing for me? Sure. Yeah, of course. Um, so licensing is when you um, have your own business and yeah. you work for yourself and you either go to trade shows or you work with an agent. Okay. So you can do right. either one. So um, you still own the design and they pay you uh, to basically use your design. Yes. And the, okay. normally it's in the form of a royalty. Um, That's what we call it. I, d I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a royalty. Um, if you work with an agent, you split that royalty 50%, um, but they do a lot of the selling for you. So you don't actually have to reach out to companies. Um, they already have those relationships in place and can kind of gauge like where your designs, who your designs would fit with the best. So you're not like fumbling around in the dark, especially if you're new to the industry, uh, but they do take 50%. So that's something to consider. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah. Okay. So, um, I think you did a podcast recently and I did ask you um, if you were going to re repost it on, I don't think it was a podcast. I think it was a short course um, on how to refine your style for your portfolio. Oh yeah. Um, I, I mean, it is one of my questions on you and I see, I think you, you I saw that on um, Instagram probably about a day after I sent you these questions and I was like, Oh man, I wish I'd watched that. And um because the other thing that I'm now finding, um, trying to get back into this is, um, who am I as a designer and what, what are, what, what makes me unique, um, as a designer. And I think defining one's style is really helpful. Um, I'd love for you to be able to post that, that video. <laughs> it's definitely <laughs> something that I'd be interested in watching. Yes. I need to get the replay from Design Hill. Um, mm. I, I was a guest on their uh, webinar, so um, yeah, but I can ask them to get the replay and hopefully I'll be able to like post it to YouTube or something. Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to ask, ask that question then because I think I'll wait for that to come out because <laughs> okay. I think it's a whole subject on its own. It's a whole subject. Yeah. And yeah. I would say that having your own style is super important if you mm. want to have your own business and especially if you want to go into licensing. Yes. However, if you're freelancing or, or if you want to kind of work full time for a company, it's not as important important um no because you honestly want to show that you, you can be versatile if you're working for a company mm. and you know that you can do a range of styles right? yes because they might have different projects come up for you and you need See, that's how we were taught in uh, when at university we were taught to go in a certain style like if you're looking at designing toile you know there is a very definite style in that or are you looking at doing African, Afri you know, sort of African geometric patterns? There's a definite style there. And you can't really get your own sort of vibe going with, with something like that. I think for the most part, um, where you can really express yourself is either through illustrative work, like, you know, your kitty's illustrative work or florals or something like that. Um, freehand painting is definitely, um, but I mean, if you're looking at a jaguard, the <laughs> You can't really. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty uh, standard. <laughs> mm. So um, then the third question that I wanted to ask you is um, your clients. How did you initially identify them? Or, I mean, if you, when you were in university, did you work with any of them that you, or is it just like a general knowledge in the industry here that people kind of know who the big guns are and, mm -hmm. or is there a list, a magic list? <laughs> <laughs> 
So there is not one magic list. However, there are really easy ways to find out once you um, kind of know where to look. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe Shannon McNabb on Skillshare. Are you a member of Skillshare? I am. Okay. Uh, look at Shannon McNabb's classes because um, she will, she has a good class on how, how to find clients. And if you go out and you're in the store um, and you see something like a greeting card, for example, and you look on the back and you see that an artist did it, yes, you know that, okay, this is a company I can reach out to because they are licensing artists, mm -hmm. right? Um, okay. Another way is to look at the attendees of trade shows. Um, so if you're wanting to be in home decor, for example, high point market is a really good one. Um, it really does kind of depend on which industry you're trying to sell to. Um, yes. high point is going to be mostly like the home decor. Mm. Um, however, if you wanted uh, to be in stationery or something like that, maybe uh, New York now, or, um, I don't know, there's some different, you can research some different trade shows, but you can look at a list of like who attended the trade shows usually on their website and you could potentially try to reach out to companies yes. that way. Sometimes That's a good idea. Did okay. not think about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so sometimes I think it's just everything in the States is so much bigger. So it's like really overwhelming. Um, yeah. I was on a, another uh, tech or another surface design Facebook page. And one of the women posted a artwork of hers and she's like, I'm just sort of starting out. I'm not really sure if I'm doing this right. So overwhelmed on how to actually get this out there. And I think a lot of us that are, technically trained and stuff like that are oh, this is where we all sitting is mm -hmm. sort of this overwhelming like okay so now I've got everything I've got my portfolio I've got everything what now um then obviously how do you approach these companies like are most of them open to being just approached like uh to I don't know a art director or um you know do you email them contact them send them a link to your portfolio um, or do you actually work through, like, I know you've got an agency or an agent that you work through. Right. Yeah. So what I did is, um, there's two ways of really going about it. I think that they're, that are the most effective and especially like time effective. Mm -hmm. Um, and one is to, is going to be to exhibit at a trade show because you're going to meet everyone who's walking the show and, and you know, attending the mm -hmm. show is looking for artwork. Right. And so you're, going to make contacts that way and it's not going to be as awkward if you then email them you can say hey we yes. met at blueprint or we met at surtex um i have some new artwork for you and they're going to be a lot more receptive to that rather than you just sort of cold calling or cold emailing you can yes. do that but it might it might take a lot more effort um before they're actually like okay like i have five minutes today let me open this email and maybe you've already emailed them five times which is really discouraging yeah. and i think artists aren't really necessarily the best salespeople all the time no <laughs> and we get really discouraged like oh they didn't respond to my email like crap like they hate me or they hate yeah. my artwork you know and I'm being annoying but like that's why I went that's why I ended up going with an agent because my agent is not afraid to do that and I mean yeah. I mean I can do it but like I I don't like it I don't like it I'm not good at yeah. it um I don't want to do it so going to a yeah. trade show is one way to do it if you have the money to do it. It does cost money. Like it's an investment yeah. to go to a trade show. Um, and you kind of have to make that investment maybe two or three times before, you know, you really, really, really get the yeah. benefits of it. Um, and sometimes I've heard also that buyers sometimes want to see that you're going to keep coming to the trade shows before they're really willing to work with you and that yeah. you're not just like a, you know, on Love night. right. Exactly. So um, yeah, so I would say either go to a trade show or work with an agency. That is going to be the fastest way to gain clients. Mm -hmm. An agency already has the relationships, um, but you don't have to pay. You don't have to make that investment of going to a trade show because uh, yeah. they go to the trade shows for you. So it kind of just uh, the trade off on that, like you said, the trade off on that is they take a fifty percent cut. Exactly. Which you know what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot. It just, it just depends on, um, you know, if how much you want to do yourself. And if you want to yeah. take on that follow up, um, sending clients, once you've met them at a trade show, sending them new work, being really regular about that. Um, and you can totally do that. A lot of artists work that way. I've talked to artists who are like, very passionate about not using an agent. <laughs> but I felt like it was the right thing for me to do just because yeah. I, um, I went to Blueprint and I was really glad that I went 
to Blueprint. I don't regret that at all. I made some really good contacts there, but I don't really have uh, the capital to continue going to trade shows. Yes. Texas coming up in February. If I had the capital to do that, like maybe that's what I would have done, but I'm just like, I cannot spend another. No. Cause I mean, these aren't all like in your local backyard either. I would, I would assume they're like in big, um, big, big places like New York or, um, Las Vegas, Las Vegas, Atlanta. Um, and I can go, I mean, I'm close to Atlanta, so I can go to that one, but that's not really the biggest one for surface pattern design. Um, but it's still good, even if you're not exhibiting, if you're close enough where you can drive, it would still be good to go and just walk the show, talk to oh, people, yeah. meet other artists, you know, meet some people there. So that's always a good thing to do as well if you're able Is to there a place where you can, like online, where you can actually find textile shows? Or do you have, um, like, I don't know, do you, does one just search textile shows in the US or? Yeah, you could definitely try to search that. Um, I, I mean, because I worked in textiles, I was exhibiting with the company I worked for. So I kind of just know from being in the industry. Mm -hmm. Um, But High Point, if you wanted to write them down, High Point, North Carolina is a big one for home decor. Um, Atlanta Market has a lot of different shows. So that's a good one. They do twice a year. Uh, Las Vegas is a good one, like you said. Um, In surface pattern design, Blueprint and Surtex are the biggest ones. And they are in New York. Blueprint is also in San Francisco, but I heard that one was like maybe not as strong as New York. Um, yeah. I mean, it could be different every year, but yeah. Um, and then if, let me see if there are any other ones. I think that's pretty much the bulk of it. Yeah. Um, see, the only I, ones that I was ever exposed to were in Europe. Um, so there's a massive one. I think it's called Hermetix, and that's in Europe in Germany. Um, oh, with- Heimtex. Is it high tech? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to that one when I was working for the uh, bed linen company in South Africa, and I'm talking like 98. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, and that was mind blowing. Um, I mean, I think we walked half of half of the halls there, and it just blew my mind that mount and the the quality the quality of design and the quantity of it was just. But it wasn't just designers that were exhibiting there. It's big mills from China, Pakistan, all over Europe and stuff like that. That was incredible. Um, I'm I'm not expecting that in at uh, Blueprints or Sotex by no means, but (laughs) it might be a really great place to just go and have a look. I think. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, no, the, I've been to Heimtex and that is definitely more uh, the manufacturing side of things, I would yeah. say. Um, and Surtex and Blueprint are more just surface pattern design, which I don't awesome. think that the Chinese, I no. don't know, I, I didn't really see anyone at Blueprint that was, um, you know, from over, you know, in the Chinese market or Indian market or Pakistan. Um, mm-hmm. I did see some buyers that were there that were from some of the Chinese markets and they were looking for buyouts um, at Blueprint. So, okay. yeah. Um, and then, so obviously um, you first started working for somebody. And my next question was, is when did you actually start like your Etsy shop? Was that something that you did on the side? <laughs> was it the, is it somewhere where you would recommend somebody to start? Like how does that tail into your career? Yeah, I kind of have funny feelings about Etsy at this point in time. I, uh, I started my Etsy shop just really as an outlet because I was very miserable in my graphic design job. Like I was really working for a crazy person, um, but I didn't really feel like I had. Oh, yeah. He literally <laughs> like stalked our social media accounts, like oh. would make us like friend people that he was interviewing and try to like find bad pictures on them to see if he wow. wanted to hire them or not. Just like great. I mean, he was insane. Um, yeah, I had a narcissist, so I'm, I, I get you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was very manipulative, very like, you need to be loyal to this company, blah, blah, blah. But like, I don't know, he was, he was a manipulator. Um, but anyway, I just, yeah, it was up and down every day. And so it was very much an emotional roller coaster. People got fired all the time for like nothing. Um, so you never felt like secure. Uh, but on top of that, like, even if I wasn't working for a crazy person, I just kind of realized that graphic design wasn't really like what I wanted to be doing so much, but I didn't really know what else to do because I was a painter 
And I just thought like everyone thinks like, oh, like if I can't paint or if I don't want to teach or be a professor Mm -hmm. um, or go to grad school, like I had already spent enough money on college. Like I can't, you know, take out a hundred grand in loans just to like (laughs) become a professor. You know, maybe if I was going to med school, it would like pay off, but not, you know, in the field of art. So I didn't do that. Uh, So I thought, okay, well, I'll just do graphic design. Like what else is there? I really didn't know. Um, and so I did graphic design and it, it was just kind of like, well, I, I think it'll still be creative enough, but I just wasn't uh-huh. loving it. And so then it was about that time. I think this was about maybe 2010, 2011. And so I started, you know, Etsy was starting to really gain, gain some traction at that point. You know, uh, Facebook was becoming bigger. This is like this whole age of the internet where like things, you know, Pinterest was invented around this time. So we were like, oh my God, like there are all these artists and like, what are they doing? How did they get that career? Like what they're drawing patterns, like what? (laughs) And like, I, that's kind of how I discovered textile design uh, because my college didn't ever talk about it. Like it wasn't, I went to a liberal arts college. They had an art major, but like that wasn't really a viable career path, you know, for someone to be hired directly out of school. And so, yeah, I was doing graphic design and that's how I discovered textile design. Uh, I discovered a lot of textile designers via Etsy. Um, mm-hmm. And so I started my own Etsy shop, but I felt like it can't be competitive to my day job because mm-hmm. my boss was crazy and he would have probably fired me if he knew I you know, did anything at all similar, even though it wouldn't have been yeah. competitive. Um, but so I started doing more like stationary and greeting cards on my Etsy shop. That's how I started yeah. out. And it was just an outlet and it was really good for a while. You know, like a lot of people bought mm-hmm. my stuff and um, then it kind of evolved and I was doing more like avatars and character designs, which I still do. Um, I still sell like clip art from that. So I ended up creating like clip that art on designs. Your website. And... Say that again. I did see that on your website. So I was like, hey. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of random when you know I'm a textile designer. It probably looks <laughs> kind of random. I'm always struggling with, do I need to like niche down more? Is this like confusing customers and stuff? Yes. But, um, but yeah, I do both. Um, but as of right now, I feel like Etsy is extremely saturated. Yes. So I, I don't really make, I don't know, honestly, like I feel like Etsy charges too much and I'm not even doing any marketing or advertising on their site anymore. And I still feel like they charge me just, and I don't really even know what it's for. Like, I'm sure they could tell me, but I'm like, I don't even understand what I'm getting charged for. And I don't even always make that many sales anymore. So administrative fees. Yeah. And so (laughs) I don't, do you have an Etsy shop as well or um, no, I was humming and hawing about it because one of the other little sidetrack things that I was looking into was doing, you know, it's so much easier to do sort of t-shirt design and have that one-off sort of illustration on t-shirt design. And Americans are crazy for t-shirts. Like, it <laughs> has blown my mind. You guys are like, hey, we're going on a camp. Let's make a t-shirt. We're going there. Let's make a t-shirt. <laughs> it's I think because in South Africa, we at schools are forced to wear school uniforms. Okay. You know, any sort of like group thing that we have to wear something that looks the same, we're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we're over <laughs> that. That's funny. No. So, um, my mom actually was saying to me the other day, well, why don't you do that? Because they'll definitely buy something that you put on a t shirt. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I looked at, I think it's Bonfire that actually creates uh, that print shirts. And I was thinking maybe I should do something along those lines. And would it be worth my while creating an Etsy shop? Where else would you sell something like that, that markets like a generated, um, you know, it's like everybody knows Etsy. Everybody goes to look for stuff on Etsy. It's one of the first things that pop up when you search for like customized things. Is it worth your while doing something like that? I don't know. Like, if you're wanting to get into textiles or as surface design, is it even worth your while going that route? I, like, this is why I wanted to ask you the question. Yeah. Like, My opinion is no, only because if you're going to get into selling physical products, and I've tried this, like I've, <laughs> I've tried to sell some t-shirts. I didn't, I mean, I didn't like go all out or anything, but um, I tried to sell some t-shirts. I also like tried to have a, a whole yoga mat business because I was like, <laughs> how would you design for yoga mats, right? And I literally bought 500 yoga mats. I worked with a guy on Alibaba from China and like they produced them. I bought them and I quickly realized that like, if you're going to sell physical products, 
the majority, 95% of your time is going to be on inventory, logistics, uh, selling, marketing. No. And like 5% design. And so if you want to be a designer and like that's what you want to spend most of your time doing, I would say don't sell physical products. Yeah. And on Etsy, it's going to be physical products. A lot of your time is going to be spent on shipping, packaging, the t-shirts, um, reordering, you know, if they're selling is, well. This is kind of what I'm realizing is, is that if, if, you know, this is part of the defining your career, you know, and defining who you are and, you know, just talking to you about stuff like this is really helping me sort of get the order right in my head because I think one of my biggest problems has been is, is like, I've got so many ideas yeah. And like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I am literally writing them down, like next to my bed at night, like, oh, this would be a great idea to do. I mean, even cake decorating came up in my, <laughs> so yeah. um, my point is, is that, you know, there's so many little avenues that you like, I call them rabbit holes because literally you are like Alice in Wonderland going down these little rabbit holes. Oh yeah. And what I'm trying to look for is like a, if this is what I want to do, where are my pitfalls and like, where are the things that are like energy suckers? Cause what I want right now is something that is going to give me a smooth path from A to B and keep on a very focused path as well. Um, right. And I'm trying to cull all the rubbish ideas in my mind of, you know, the possible, and I call them get rich quick schemes. Because <laughs> you know, they get marketed to you. Like Etsy is marketed to a great platform. You can sell stuff and, you know, it's, you know, minus all the PT and actually it lands up being 90% admin and 10, you know, like 10% creative. And that's what I don't want. I think that's the one thing in my mind I'm very clear on. Um, and it's good to hear, I get af like af affirmation from you that my, my thoughts and my, my thought pattern on, is it worth me doing something like that? And you've just given me like affirmation on like, actually come and don't waste your time. Um, yeah, I've tried it. So I'm glad that helps you. I mean, obviously, you know, everyone's different. And one of my favorite YouTubers is this uh, girl named Catherine, but her channel is called Catnip with a K. And yes. you should totally check her out as well. Um, she does Etsy and she sells a lot of stickers. Um, she's still creative with it, but she's hired two people to do all the shipping <laughs> and packaging for her. Um, so you should watch her channel because that'll give you a good insight. She does a lot of studio vlogs. Yes. So that'll give you some insight into like what her daily life is like running an Etsy shop. Um, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, that, it just wasn't for me. So it's not to say that, you know, some people wouldn't be happy doing that, but like, I literally don't want to fool with any of that stuff. Um, yeah. I just want to be able to focus on the designing and like, whether that's in, you know, just the surface pattern design. I love that aspect as well. I also love the textile design, which has a little bit more of product development in it, as I'm sure, you know, from university, yes. but, um, that's also extremely creative. Um, but those are two kind of yeah. different fields, um, I would say, or different job functions that maybe you're going to have one more with a company and one more with, you know, working on your own, um, unless you are going to sell your own products, but yeah. unless you have that the, that the effort that you put into, and I mean, my, my whole idea was, okay, so I'll design the stuff. I'll find like a vendor that can actually print and post it. And all I do is be like the here's my design. Let me go onto that website, have them print it and ship it to you. And, but I'll sell it on Etsy. That was kind of like my thinking. And the more I thought about it, I'm like, actually, this is like a lot more PT than what is necessary. Yeah. I think that there are a lot of um, like husband and wife teams that end up dividing responsibilities that way. <laughs> like, no, I think my husband will divorce me if I have to work with him. Definitely. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't want to work with my husband either. No. But I think that um, like Justina Blakeney does that. Like she does all the creative and then her husband now works for her and does all the logistics and like yes. all that kind of stuff. Um, but I would say that that would work if you were willing to kind of go into business with a partner. It doesn't have to be yeah. your husband, but if you found like the perfect kind of sales partner or math partner or logistics mm. partner, then somebody that likes to do the admin junk. Yes. Then yeah, that, could be, that could be viable, but you know, you really have to trust someone to be, uh, to be a business partner and really yeah. find the right person or be willing to hire someone. So then you would mm. need the startup capital to do that. Yeah. 
Okay, so then um, the next question that I wanted to ask you was, how do you market yourself? Like, it, I, I gather it's online. I know you've got a fantastic website. Like, is there anywhere else that you market yourself on as a designer? Um, I know your agent does that for you now, but before they you- do a little bit, they don't do a ton of marketing, but they do go to the trade shows. Yes. So that's probably, I would say the trade shows is going to be the most bang for your buck. Yeah. Um, in terms of just getting the right people to know who you are, because okay. you want obviously to, you know, the people that are going to buy your stuff to know who you are. Um, and then, I mean, I do, a, I've been doing a lot of marketing um, and I don't, I don't know if this is, if I would recommend it for everyone at mm -hmm. this point in time, but like I've, uh, I've made a huge effort on Instagram. I make a huge yes. effort on Pinterest. Um, I make, I mean, I do the podcast, I do these live calls, I do, I, I post the replays to my YouTube channel. So like, if people are on YouTube, they can find me that way. Um, I've recently started to post more to LinkedIn, because it kind of dawned on me that, hey, maybe the buyers are more on LinkedIn. So I need to be yep. posting stuff there, maybe rather than, I don't know, Pinterest or Instagram. Um, but I have had one person reach out to me because they found my stuff on Instagram. And um, mm -hmm. ended up doing a licensing deal. So they're, um, a small company, but I think that's going to be good. And uh, yeah, so you definitely can get found on Instagram, but I have kind of a love hate relationship with Instagram because it's really hard to grow yeah. and get eyeballs on that platform. Yeah. Without having your, your bought followers and all that nonsense. No, I get that. Um, and it takes a lot of time to actually set up your, your um, posts and stuff like that too, and getting your, your product out there just right. I mean, um, I think uh, we started talking about agents and them going to a trade show and stuff like, um, I don't know if you're wanting or able to share, what are the costs involved with going through an agent? Like, are you, do you pay them? Um, you know, or is it just, can you explain that whole relationship? Yeah, definitely. Um, no, I don't have to pay the agent anything. Um, it literally is just a 50-50 relationship they get the 50 percent on the royalty and so i kind of like that situation because if i don't get paid they don't get paid exactly you see what i'm saying yeah. so like the only thing that you might have to pay for if you go the route of an agent is you might want to hire your own lawyer to review the contract um, before yeah. you sign with an agent just to make sure everything's good everything's the way you want it and you may want to negotiate some things so yeah. i have a family member who's a lawyer who uh was kind enough to like look over the contract for me and he had a few pointers and uh, we negotiated a few things, but overall, I mean, it's a pretty, it's a standard contract that they give out to mm -hmm. every artist that they hire. So some artists maybe will uh, try to change some things, but it's, it's pretty general for uh, what when they give you, out to all of their artists. When you, sorry, when you, um, when you started your relationship with your agent, did you basically give them just like your website or your uh, online portfolio? I've got like a Behance portfolio, but it's mm -hmm. purely graphics. I'm now hell for leather trying to do a textile one and actually setting up an actual textile one. I've been out of the industry for like 15 years. So I'm like, okay, scramble textile portfolio. Here we go. Um, once you've got that, do you give them like a link to your portfolio? Do you have to, for them in order to go and sell your work, do you give them a hard copy of your portfolio or how does that work? How does that relationship work? They don't need a hard copy only because, um, they don't really need, I mean, it, your designs are going to be going on a variety of products. They don't even know which yeah. ones. And so you really don't need a hard copy, um, I happened to be in Las Vegas for a bachelorette weekend and there was a trade show, a licensing expo mm -hmm. trade show that was the same week. So I ended up extending my trip um, so that I could attend this show and just kind of see, you know, I was there anyway. So I was yeah. like, I'm going to just see like if any artists are exhibiting at this show, do I need to exhibit at this show? Like who can I talk to? Who can I meet? And so what I discovered was that not many artists were exhibiting at this show, but there were a lot of agents and agencies okay. ex exhibiting at this show. So I went around, I had my iPad and I had my portfolio just as a PDF on my yeah. iPad. And I went around and introduced myself to a bunch of different agencies. Um, and so that was really kind of, I was kind of lucky to be able to do that because I was able to meet them in person, face to face, kind of see who I liked the best, who responded really well to my work yeah. and that kind of thing. 
a few of the agents were like, um, oh, we'll just go apply on our website. And like, they sort of, I mean, they were super busy, but you know, it was kind of like, oh, well, I'm here. Like I could come back on like the slow day, you know, at the end of the show. But, um, but you definitely can apply on agents' websites. Um, and so I think from there, they'll kind of decide if they want to work mm -hmm. with you or not. And then, you know, you might have a few agents contact you back and then you kind of have to talk to them and mm -hmm. figure out who will be the best fit for each other. These agencies that you're talking about, Lauren, are they, um, are they specifically to the textile industry or are they representing just different kinds of uh, artists for different kinds of brands? Um, um, I, think some of them, I think some of them work differently. The agent that I ended up going with, they actually sell a lot of wall art as well, which is kind of okay. random, but, um, but I think they do different industries. Um, not all of them are going to sell wall art, but yeah. that's another avenue that, uh, the agent Oh yeah, I know. Wallpaper. For, I actually interviewed for a job at a company called Walls Need Love a couple uh -huh. months ago. Uh -huh. It wasn't um, for actually designing the wallpaper. It was more sort of designing and managing what they had online. Um, okay. So your mock-ups and taking the existing artwork and putting it into a room. So to, you know, your mock-up type environment to show, showcase the product. I was like, mm, no, not really. Anyhow, it wasn't a good fit from both sides. But um, what I wanted to ask you is how does one go about finding an agent? I mean, again, it's the same thing like finding the clients. Do you just go on and search for agents for surface design or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I ended up finding a lot of the agencies that I wanted to contact anyway, just because um, I follow a lot of artists on Instagram and a lot of them will put in their bio, like represented by okay. so-and-so. And so that's one good way to kind of see if you like a certain style or a certain artwork, you might say, oh, well then this is kind of similar to me or like what I want to do. So maybe this agent would be a good fit for me. Um, and you, you know, like I said, I happened to be at the Las Vegas show. So I was able to just kind of walk around to all the booths and introduce myself to all the agents that were there. Um, yeah. but you could do that probably really at any show. Um, yeah. You, I mean, if you wanted to do it that way, you could probably go to Atlanta or wherever it's probably Atlanta is probably the closest one for you. Um, but yeah you know, you don't have to do it that way. You could just do some research online and yeah, you could try to Google uh, agencies representing textile designers or surface pattern mm -hmm. designers. And I'm sure some will come up and just up. look yeah. at artists that you appreciate and they'll, they may uh, say it on their website or their Instagram bio or something like that. Cool. Okay. Um, I think, and then, um, so what I, the other one I wanted to ask you about was sort of, uh, you did touch on it with your, um, your, when you did your agency podcast was, um, you know, your expenses, um, uh, making capital, you said that, you know, you haven't sort of matched what you were making in a career yet. And I'm totally understanding you know, understanding that it's going to take a while to be an established surface designer and stuff like that. And um, what could you share on sort of like the realities of that? Like, you know, time, timeline, like, you know, how long has it taken you to sort of establish yourself? What expenses have you sort of pinpointed that are big, you know, costs that have sort of where you've gone like, whoa, I was not expecting that. <laughs> Yeah. So if you're wanting to get into licensing, so again, it's like different, there's different avenues, right? Like obviously if you get a job with a company, you're going to be paid right away, um, which is kind of what I recommend. Although you've worked at as, as a graphic designer for a while, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend that to you. But um, if you've never worked for a textile design company um, and don't have a degree in textile design, then I think you definitely need to try to do that first, just because, mm. you know, if you're, I don't know, an art major like I was, and then all of a sudden you want to license surface pattern designs, like you're going to have a really hard time, I think, just because you don't know the industry, you don't know what to expect, you don't know, you don't, your style probably isn't even developed well yeah. enough to be commercial. Um, and so, you know, there's that, which obviously you get paid right away. Freelance is the same thing, but you are trading dollars for hours. So yeah. you may be doing what you love. You may be getting to draw patterns all day, but you are trading dollars for hours. And again, I think it's really difficult to get into freelancing if you don't know people. Yes. Um, the people that have approached me for freelance projects is because we already knew each other from mm -hmm. one of my previous jobs. Um, I worked at two different textile design companies back in Atlanta. Yeah. So I also find that people, when, when you do freelance, they expect you to do it for peanuts. You know, that's the other problem. So 
you kind of give them your hourly rate and they're like, whoa, you know, I'm not wanting to buy a Mona Lisa here. I'm wanting to buy a little doodle that I can repeat. And I'm like, yes, but that's my hourly rate. And, you know, mm-hmm. I think that's also like a, a hard thing to tackle when you are freelancing. That's why I'm, I'm looking at this whole licensing thing and possibly an agent thing, but I think I can only really give it the time that it warrants looking into that once I've established my portfolio properly. Yeah. And I think it depends on who your clients are when you are freelancing. If you're working for a bigger company, they're going to have a budget for that and they're probably going to pay their designers sort of a similar rate. And so maybe it's a little bit less than you were wanting, but like if it's market rate, then you kind of have to accept that. Um, But if it's a smaller company that just like saw some of your designs on Instagram, then Sometimes they don't have an understanding of what it costs to hire like a professional designer. Um, And maybe they're used to just like working with some people on Upwork or whatever, but you're you're probably not going to get the same quality. Right. But they might not understand that. Mm -hmm. Um, I've I've had the same thing happen in licensing (laughs) where some people have approached me on Instagram. They wanted to like buy out my designs, which buy the copyright, which now that I'm doing licensing, I'm like, all right, like, I would be willing to do that, but this is what I charge people at blueprint. You know, these were my prices at blueprint. So I'm going to charge you the same prices and they have no concept and no understanding. And they're also not open to just licensing my designs um, for a much lower rate or for a much lower cost. Um, Did Did you have to get a lawyer to help you with your licensing? Like, or does your agency do that for you? No, they do all the contracts. Um, once, yeah, they do all the contracts after I'm signed with them. So the only contract I had to really get my lawyer to review was the contract with my agent. And then there were a couple of contracts I got from blueprint that um, I just sent to my family and like everyone looked over it and they were like, Oh yeah, like that sounds fine. Um, So it didn't really actually cost you anything to license a design. It's just a standard blanket that you like a contract that you've got with clients that purchase your designs already. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I just wanted to say is like, um, uh, number 10 was, are there any legal or tax requirements to setting up your own, um, what you do or textile freelance or licensing? Is there anything that you as a designer are? Cause I think these are a lot of hidden costs. Like people don't realize like once you can't just do it and people give you money and that's it. Like, um, the one thing that I've been painfully aware having come into this country uh, on a green card and looking at, um, you know, you get scrutinized by the IRS, I think it is and stuff like that. And I'm like, Whoa, okay. (laughs) Very different to how we set up freelancing and working for yourself and stuff in South Africa. There are apparently a whole bunch of things that you need to look at. So I don't know what your experience has been like with any of that. Um, I can only, yeah, I can only really speak as a U.S. citizen, but um, it... I'm doing that, by the way. (laughs) Oh, good, good, great. (laughs) That's awesome. I'm trying to get my mother-in-law to as well. She's lived here for like at least 30-something years, probably almost 40 years, and she's not a citizen. (laughs) Oh, I... Come on, we need your vote. (laughs) Three years, three years, and... uh, I think it's five years if you just come in here generally on a, on a, on a green card, but if you're married to American, which I am (laughs) three years and I'm like, all right, doing this. I actually had strangely enough, a really horrible experience with when looking for permanent employment as a graphic designer, I had a woman put the phone down on me the minute she found out that I wasn't a U.S. citizen. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So there's like the, the minute they hear me, they're obviously like, well, you're definitely not from here. How are you here? And I kind of was in the throes of explaining to her that I had a green card and that I was allowed to work and she put the phone down on me. So that's just rude. <laughs> anyhow. Um, I mean, the only thing that I wanted to ask you was, is, um, is there like a threshold where you, where you start paying taxes? Are you paying taxes like on a design by design basis? Or is that something that your agency deals with? Um, the agency does not do taxes for me. Um, however, they probably, let's see. With the sale I'm still, of new, I'm still new with working with the agent. So I'm not, I haven't done taxes with, having an agent yet, Mm -hmm. but, um, I'm pretty sure I'm responsible for my own taxes. Um, but it's not like 
design per design. It's more like, okay, this was my total income for the year okay. versus my expenses. And so like, if I'm not profitable yet, then I'm not mm-hmm. really going to owe any taxes, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It yeah. Does. So and, I mean, setting up your studio and stuff like that, do you write off certain things to tax as well? You know, like your usage? I mean, cause these are all things that if you're having this business, is that like part of like your LLC that you're allowed to now be able to write certain things off? Yeah, I can write off. I write off anything that I buy for my business. Um, mm-hmm. And I can write off like a percentage of my house because I work yeah. out of my house. So like the little area that I work out of, I can write that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I can do something with that. Yeah. Um, something with my cell phone because I use it for work. Um, so there's like a percentage of that I can write off. But other than that, I don't, it just takes too much time yeah. to like keep track of things. Like I'm too busy for that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, anything I buy for my business, I try to keep track of and write yeah. that off. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then, I mean, that leads into the, uh, my next question, which was, do you need an LLC or, you know, is it something that you just set up to protect yourself or, um, I think it's good to have only because in the like rare case that you would ever get sued. Um, and I'm not a, you know, I'm not a lawyer. So like, I can't give legal advice yeah. technically, but like your experience from my understanding is that if, if someone sued you because let's say your design somehow looked too similar to someone else's design, Mm -hmm. even if you didn't copy, if it could be like you used the same inspiration or there was a collective consciousness, things like that do happen. Um, And so if someone tried to sue you, then they can't go after any of your personal things like your house or your retirement account or whatever it is. Um, They can only go after your LLC. Did it, did it cost you to set up your LLC or was it just literally again, something that you did through a lawyer? Oh, I didn't even use a lawyer. You can just do it online. <laughs> the IRS will give you a, a EI number. <laughs> so it's just like a tax ID. Um, okay. It's really easy. I think it costs like maybe $50. Okay, cool. So definitely as, as a, once you're established and you've got everything set up, it's something that is a definite thing to look into as a designer. I mean, I, that's my biggest fear is going on here because you get so much inspiration from all these people on social media and you think one night you've dreamed up this wonderful design. Meanwhile, it's in your subconscious, like very similar. And that's like my biggest fear as a designer is being like, Hey, you copying my stuff. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny. I've seen some designers that I absolutely love and that I follow and they've, been mad because they felt like someone was copying them and and they show this other person's design. And I'm like, Oh, like, I think that's different enough, actually. Yes. Um, Well, the law in South Africa is 30% that you've got to change design. And the only reason why I know this is because I had previous employment actually coming up to me saying, here's a design, copy it and change it 30%. Oh, yeah, we totally had that going on here as well. Um, But I think that, honestly, like if people are ripping quote unquote, ripping you off or using you for inspiration. And like, that's just a compliment. And like, it's going to happen. And like, you need to be focused on creating the next thing, not focused on like what you did in the past. Um, And so I get that it's frustrating. But like, honestly, that's just a part of being a designer. It's kind of like, if you want to be a famous actor, like the paparazzi is going to follow you. Like, sorry. (laughs) <laughs> it's like that's just part yeah, of the game. You protect your designs online. I mean, obviously, you don't put your entire portfolio up online for everybody to see. I mean, that's that's you know, you select designs that you put up. Do you watermark your designs? Do you keep them at a lower res? Because um, mm-hmm. we've had people in the past like going onto our portfolios, like on Behance, like especially some of the Chinese market, they'll go and troll, pull off a couple designs, and literally go into Illustrator and trace it. I mean, I've heard of stuff like that happening. I mean, like, how do you protect yourself as a designer like that? I mean, do you or what's your advice there? It's something that honestly, I'm not too overly worried about, maybe just because it hasn't happened to me yet. I don't know. Um, I I mean, I do use low res images that I put online. So there's that. And I always put my website and my logo on every design that I post. And that's more for the reason that... um, you know, if a buyer were to see something that I did on Pinterest and they Mm -hmm. saw it, maybe maybe they clicked through and saw my profile, but they didn't take the time to write down my name. Yeah. Maybe they just pulled the image. Then 
later on they can say, oh, like this is by Lauren Poole. Like now I'm going to contact her and maybe she can license this design to me. Now, some of the designs I do put on Pinterest, I also put like contact for licensing just okay. because I do think that if you put that little extra step and I, I kind of go back and forth on that, like, are people not going to share it because they have, it has this annoying like thing in the middle yeah. you know, on it. But I do think it, I think that people hesitate when you say like, this is copyrighted Lauren, mm -hmm. Lauren Leslie studio LLC. Um, please contact for licensing. I do think that people hesitate when they see something like that. And like, they mm -hmm. might be a little bit more careful than to just like knock it off. But ultimately like people are going to use your designs yeah. for inspiration mm -hmm. if your designs are good. And so I don't think that's a bad boat to be in. I would rather be kind of at the yeah. top of the food chain, if you will. <laughs> and like, you know, I'd rather people be ripping me off than me not being able to like sell or be a successful designer. I so. don't agree with you. Um, okay. So then one of the last, uh, like just something quick, like if you could map something out for somebody like step by step, like, you know, obviously starting with a oh, high, I want to be a surface designer to where you are now. What is sort of a loose time frame or, or step by step sort of thing that you would set up? if you could share. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that it's probably just going to depend on how quickly someone is able to work and how much time outside of maybe their regular job that they want to, or being a mom like you are or something like that, that they're able to <laughs> devote to, you know, developing their own portfolio. Um, because I was working as a textile designer before I was a little bit scared to start d developing my own patterns for licensing while I was still working at the company, just because I didn't want there to be any confusion on who owned yeah. what, even if I was doing it on my own time. Um, and now that I'm outside of that, I don't know if that was necessarily the right decision. I mean, I definitely had my reasons for doing that and understand why um, I did it. Um, but I also, I don't know, it took a lot of time to develop a, another portfolio or like the collection yeah. I was taking the blueprint, right? So if I had already kind of had a head start on that, um, that would have been really beneficial. Mm -hmm. So that might be the first thing that if, if you're not worried about the company that you now work for and you haven't signed a contract that says that they pretty much own everything that you create, yes. then I would start developing your own patterns. Thank um, you, trade. I think... I've dealt with a couple of those. It's, you know, and, and like they, that, sometimes, yeah. they sometimes go for like two years after you've left the company. That's crazy. Yeah. That's yeah. like, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just Okay. Cause right. I mean, somebody like me, so my, my steps where I see myself now, I mean, I feel like I'm starting on a clean slate because whatever textiles I, I had a portfolio and I think whatever portfolio I did have kind of 15 years ago is no longer relevant to what we've got now. So I'm thinking right. like first step, establish your design style, maybe fiddle around with that and then develop your portfolio, put your portfolio online, like a company like Behance or, you know, on your own personal website or both more exposure. And then I'm thinking like from there, is it um, contact possibly agents or go to trade shows, then possibly set up an LLC and then, you know what I mean? Like I, like this is sort of like the order of things that I'm thinking. And would you agree with that? Like, is yeah, that definitely, kind of I think you can L set up an LLC probably before you go to um, a trade show or start reaching out to agents only because I, like when I signed with my agent, I signed it as my LLC okay. not under my personal name. So oh. I think I would do that first and then you can start writing things off as well. Um, whatever you need to buy, like if you need to buy equipment or you <laughs> paints or yeah anything <laughs> um did you did you register your company um while we're talking about llc or is that is does that fall under an llc like did you register lauren pool studios or i mean is it something that you have to do because i mean i've got a company name some way designs but i mean i don't like that's something that i brought through from south africa um so Moy is actually my second language which means so beautiful or so pretty Aww. so um do can i take that now and i register my llc under sumoy designs or do i have to register the business and then do an llc uh the llc is your business so, oh, so when, when you go to find an llc i think the uh, database will tell you whether or not that name is already taken available yeah 
Yeah. So it's not a CC or LTD or what's it? No, none of that. Like a corporation or no, yeah. I'm so lost with all I this. Think, not I my think, wheelhouse. Yeah, I think LLC, like sole proprietor, all that stuff. Yeah. LLC is the best one for a, a small designer. business or an independent yeah. designer. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then last one is um, what three things have you found to be invaluable in becoming an established uh, designer? <laughs> Like what are the three things that you're like, I cannot live without. This is like my, you know? Yeah. So, um, I could talk about several things, but <laughs> <laughs> I think that really a uh, mindset and patience is probably, I know that sounds like sort of a, a stupid answer, but mm -hmm. it is, it can be like very mentally challenging because you're just so hard on yourself and yeah. like, I'm not a person that's like ever been afraid of hard work. Like I have, you know, not, you know, my mom was very like complimentary of me always. And like, she's my biggest fan. So like, I, I think I have enough self-confidence, you know, you know, in general, but um, you know, when you're really waiting on getting in those royalties, when you're doing art mm -hmm. licensing specifically, um, that can really be a battlefield because you feel like you're worthless. You feel like your art mm -hmm. sucks. Like I was like crying this weekend, literally, <laughs> because I was like, maybe I'm just a failure at this, you know, <laughs> like, but it's not true. Like I have contracts in place. It's just like, mm -hmm. I contacted uh, the fabric company that I have uh, a collection, a Christmas collection coming out with. And I was like, well, like it's Christmas time. Like have has anything. Where is it? And they were like, um, Oh, like the fabric stores actually don't buy Christmas until this summer. And I was like, Oh, so like I'm waiting <laughs> till this summer to get those, you know, to start getting my yeah. royalties. And like, I might get a little bit of online sales before that, but like so far it's nothing. Yeah. So, um, and I also talked to my agent and like, um, I have like the one deal that I got from Instagram. Um, but that was pretty recently. And then she's, you know, she's been reaching out to a lot of clients, but, um, she hasn't gotten landed me any deals yet, but there are the three trade shows coming up mm -hmm. Las Vegas and Atlanta in January and then Surtex in February. So mm -hmm. she's feeling really confident about those shows that I'm actually going to get some deals, but like, I'm like, Hey, like I signed with you guys. <laughs> like where, you know, where are the contracts? Where are my deals? Realize that a lot of designers don't realize or people who have come into the surface industry that haven't been in textiles, they don't realize that there is like a year cycle where everything goes through. Um, I mean, much like your fashion industry, they're already planning and the interior cycle is a lot slower even. And as you filter down into the different categories, I mean, when you start working for the, I mean, you get your fashion, which is your forefront, then your interior, and then you get everything else that sort of like follows along. And your turnover time for that is a lot slower. I don't think people realize that. So patience, I agree with you. Is yeah. And, and I knew uh, that because I have worked in textiles, but it yeah. was still like, <laughs> to actually live it you're I mean you do get really impatient you're like okay like it's Christmas time like I want to be able to like splurge a little bit <laughs> and you're like all right um but anyway yeah so I would say patience definitely um in mindset you know just kind of I don't know I think sometimes it's nice to listen to um some of the NPR podcasts uh what's the one about entrepreneurship um I listened to one recently that was about the guy who invented Shopify. And right. I think that he lived in his in-laws basement for like almost <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> I was like, okay, I don't feel as much like a failure because this guy like <laughs> was not uh, making an income for a very long time. Yeah. Um, but I'm not trying to do anything like that. It's like, I'm just want to design business, you know? It is. <laughs> my whole thing is when my husband comes home at night and I see he's slugged his guts out at work, he's exhausted. And I'm like, here I am sitting in my home, drinking my tea <laughs> and you're working, you know, and I'm going, well, I'm a lady of luxury and I'm kind of, you know, really wanting to be able to contribute and live the American dream and I'm not helping pay for it. So. <laughs> But I think the, 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 definitely the patients, I'm very well aware that it's going to take at least a year or two after. I mean, I'm looking at blocking out like six months for just my portfolio setup, you know, and mm -hmm. really digging into designs that I feel are something that would benefit the American market. And yeah, so I think that's great. Um, 
so, okay. So that would probably be the first thing would be patience and mindset. What else mm -hmm. do I find invaluable? Um, I think also maybe trying to avoid like perfectionism or uh, like kind of being like a little bit too, I mean, you definitely want to feel good about your portfolio. Right. But I think there's kind of this happy medium between, um, you know, Undone. doing something that you're proud of and like, then like being afraid to release it or to show anyone. Yeah. Um, so sometimes you just have to put it out there and then say, Hey, I'm open to feedback. Like, and some people yeah. might say, Oh, well, that's a little too trendy or that's a little bit too this or too sweet or too, too whatever. And then you, you have to just be open to that and be, okay, cool. Um, oh, criticism. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you do that on your web, on your Facebook page at all? Like ask people to skill share or to uh, design share um, and then like critique on your Facebook page at all? I definitely do in my um, master class. So I have a master class called Textile Star where I really encourage the students to uh, feedback, give feedback on each other's work. Um, and I try to do the same. Um, and in, in the Design Tribe Facebook group, I try to do that as well. Um, I do... I did last year host an art style challenge um, yeah. for the summer. And so it's an evergreen challenge. Anyone can sign up at any time, but um, I tried to be really active over the summer and giving people feedback for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's a little bit of a, you don't want to discourage people, yeah. especially when you're not able to like see their face or talk to them in person. Um, so you just have to be careful about the feedback that you are giving. If it's yes. in a setting like that, um, but there are a couple of closed groups that I've actually stumbled across um, in my wandering, meandering research that I've done that actually do offer that. That's really cool. Um, I think because um, I'm looking for a type of, um, like you say, um, input on what is relevant here, as well as like, you know, sort of a mentorship uh, critiquing sort of type environments where you've got your peers that are looking at your work and going, yes, it's relevant, no, it's not, or what if you did X, Y, or Z? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Victoria Johnson also has some really good courses uh, for that, that kind of thing. Uh, she has one called Create Christmas, another one is Explore Florals, and another one is Create Collections. Um, mm -hmm. which I haven't done her Create Collections course, but I'd like to do it at some point. Um, but yeah, I think those kind of smaller classes where people are actually, I think part of the problem with the art style challenge I did this past summer is that it was just a free challenge. So people mm -hmm. weren't as invested and like, they didn't take it as seriously. It was just kind of like a fun thing to do if they had time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when someone actually like pays for a class, they're more like, okay, yes, yes I'm doing this. And like, I'm actually going to pay attention and like give mm -hmm. people real feedback and I just think they take it more seriously. So I'm considering this year maybe doing like an art style class as opposed to like a free challenge. Um, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure what I'm going to do this year, but I want to do something to encourage people to, you know, kind of post and like share and give that kind yeah. of feedback. Cause especially when you're working by yourself, um, if yes. you have a company, it's like you have the design team, you yes. have your art director and your boss and like, that has helped me so much in the past, which is another reason why, like if you're younger and you've never worked at a company, like Agreed. I highly recommend just getting that feedback from your art director because your eye is going to yes. develop so much better. Um, my eye is so much stronger now than it was, mm -hmm. you know, before I worked with my Absolutely. previous art directors. Okay. And then the last one, if you can think of one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What are the three things? Um, so in terms of, let's see, in terms of equipment, I, I struggled a lot with whether I should maybe buy like a Cintiq versus an iPad Pro. Um, and so I am really attached to my iPad Pro now. And if I had to choose just one, I would probably choose the iPad Pro. Um, yeah. But but I don't know. I think it's, I think the technology is changing so fast. Um, I love my Cintiq, but I don't draw on it as much as I draw on my iPad Pro. Pro. Yeah. And it's funny because I used to be very much an Illustrator girl. Like I used Adobe yes. Illustrator way more than Photoshop. But now that I'm using my iPad Pro, um, I'm starting to use Photoshop more just because it's, it's Procreate is a raster-based yes. um, app. However, I think that because it's been so popular, I think that maybe some vector apps will start to gain traction, more traction. There are a few that are pretty good, but um, 
I don't know. I think that they'll start to have more functionality and more. I'm excited to kind of see what's going to come on iPad. Yeah. I'm still stuck with my Wacom tablets with my Illustrator, and that's sort of where I'm at still. Because um, I mean, those are the yeah. tools of the trade as a graphic designer, and I haven't been able to experience the looseness and the freedom of doing um, an iPad Pro yet. Good Christmas yeah. gift idea. <laughs> yeah, that is. Um, yeah, I definitely worked on the Wacom tablet for the first eight years that I was a textile designer, so you definitely can do it that way. But I do think my style has shifted a little bit since yeah. kind of changing, like with the Apple Pencil, like you said, you can just be looser and kind of mm -hmm. like sketch first. And then I've seen, that on, I've seen so many people using like uh, Procreate and even just if you look at like the people that do typography or, um, um, you know, that, that kind of like your stylized um, hand lettering. Hand yeah. Stuff. I have not allowed myself to like watch any Skillshare classes on <laughs> hand lettering because I'm like, that is another rabbit hole that I don't yes. Think. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, I, I try to avoid that. But I mean, even just looking at people who create mandalas, there's like a really great tool in Procreate that allows you to do just a section of the mandala. And as you're drawing it out, it sort of like connects everything up and creates this beautiful. And I'm like, Dude, that takes me like four hours to do and you're doing it in like five seconds. It frustrates me, but I'm very excited to try something like that. I've been eyeing that out for quite a while. So I'm glad to hear that it's something that you're definitely um, a champion for. Um, I'm uh, hoping that maybe that might be either next birthday present or Christmas present. <laughs> hey. Content for husband listening yes, yes husband please watch <laughs> i cost him too much money <laughs> shame um yeah lauren thank you so much i think you've really given me quite a bit of direction for a lot of things um a lot to chew over and think about um I, I was a little bit sort of wishy-washy about a whole LLC and I definitely think you've given me a lot of clarity on that so i'm really glad and i'm very 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 grateful um of course yeah. Yeah, it was so nice chatting with you and talking to you, and I'm glad it could help. Um, and yeah, I'm so glad you're in the Facebook group, and we should definitely stay connected, and I'd love to like Please. hear an update, you know, maybe six months from now, a year from now, and see where you're absolutely, at. Absolutely, absolutely. I love, I'm, I'm very big into mentoring and stuff like that, so I love passing knowledge on and things like that. I mean, I worked in two textile studios where I was a senior textile designer, and um, I love mentoring and helping people and, you know, doing like the critique, like you say, having that person that helps you with refining your style and refining your design that fits the requirements of the client. I thoroughly enjoy that interpreting process. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I, I look for that from other people, irrelevant of whether they're younger than me or they've only been in the game. I just believe that many heads makes lighter work as well. So, um, yeah, I don't know if any of your other friends, like people that are on your page and stuff like that, if they ever wanted to ask me a question about something to do, because you've got all this ridiculous amount of four years of knowledge from textile design. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to share. I enjoy skill sharing as well. So, Yes. Um, is there anywhere that you want people to maybe find you online uh, or they can follow maybe your designs or patterns or if you're not ready yet, that's okay as well. But so, I just wanted to let you throw that out there if you have like an Instagram or a website or any, or so your I do have, I've got two Instagrams account, my personal one, which is just common pets at Instagram. It is an open account and I do lots of crazy crap with my kids, so okay. <laughs> that's a bit more of a mommy page. Um, but then I do have my Sua Moy designs, uh, Instagram accounts, which is S O M O O I designs. And that's on Instagram. And I'm not as active yet on there. Um, I will be though. I think what I'm going to be doing is showing a lot of my portfolio building uh, process and my design process from a textile perspective there. Um, but yeah, I think for, for the most part, I mean, I've got, like I said, a Behance, uh, but it's all graphics currently. And I think what, if people are interested in following um, my journey in establishing, establishing myself as a textile designer in the U S that would probably be the best place to find me. I mean, okay. all my accounts are interlinked. So yeah. Thanks okay. though, Lauren. I appreciate that. Oh, of course. Of course. All awesome. Right, well, I think we're ready to sign off, but Thanks. it was so wonderful talking to you and meeting you online and Absolutely. we'll catch up uh, in six months to a year. Yes. Thanks, Lauren.
Have a great time. Merry Christmas, by the way. Yeah, Merry Christmas. (laughs) Bye. Bye.